morning. My apologies, I couldn't put the notes up last night. I was away yesterday in Houston giving a lecture in a company, so I got back very late. I uploaded it all this morning, I see one some of you have just printed it out. Uh, <coughs> a reminder, on Monday you have your first midterm, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, yeah. Yes, yes. The material in there will be covered. So this is why I advise that you should all like MATLAB. Well, the concepts behind that could be there in the question, but we are not going to use MATLAB or any software for this exam. So uh, you should focus on things that you can do by hand and uh, conceptual Things that could be asked. Yeah. yeah. Right. I was going to talk to you about that. Um, there will be three problems. Uh, one would be kind of a short question, or sort of four or five short questions. Uh, shouldn't take more than a minute or two to answer these. And those are basically uh, checking concepts and whether you know how to draw a step function and functions that are more complicated than step functions and super functions, things like that. Um, and then there will be uh, two problems. Uh, one problem will be basically on uh, transfer function development. Okay, so I'll give you a describe a problem and uh, give you the differential equation so you don't have to derive the differential equation. But taking the differential equation, you will have to assemble the transfer function. Okay, so the, the current assignment number three, I think there are some problems there that you may want to take a look at. Uh, it would be very similar uh, to that. And then there is one problem which is a fairly brief uh, numerical, involving the numerical calculation on the dynamic response of a system. Okay. So three, three problems. And you may be pressed for time if you don't manage time very well. So what is important is not give me a long essay answer for a short question. And divide your time in proportion to the marks assigned to each part. And if you cannot get it done before that time, go to the next question and uh, tell me what you know about the problem, even if you're not able to complete it. You need to give me a reason to give you marks. Okay, if you give me a blank sheet, I'm not going to be able to give you any marks for that particular question. So it's important that you show that you understand the basic idea behind Every one of those questions, even if you're not able to complete it. It's a closed book, closed class, and there is a formula sheet, and the formula sheet contains basically on the Laplace transform, on the Laplace transform table, and then the derivative, integral, final value, initial value, you know, like that. Uh, maybe what I will do is. Uh, Go back. I will put up the formula sheet on Moodle. You can take a look at it beforehand so that you know what's in the formula sheet. And if you have a pressing need to see something else, then send me an email. I will send it as a request. Okay. So if you think, oh, I would like to see the solution to this post-it there, then um, uh, I'll send it that. Let's see where it can provide. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, is there any concept that you would like me to review in this lecture as a preparation for some exam? Or can we go on to the next topic? Using the transfer function. Finding your own transfer function is utilizing it. I understand what they are and okay. 
with the plant performance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a, a very good comment. Right now, we are just looking at how to build the transfer function. Why we build transfer functions, we saw earlier justification for that is that in the Laplace domain, things are algebraic. Instead of following differential equations, we just do algebraic manipulation. And um, how we do it, we can take some examples now and do it if you want. If you think that will help you, we can uh, take some examples and uh, solve them. I'm not prepared anything, but uh, uh, we can make up a problem and see how far we go. Is that something that you will, will all want to do? <laughs> You've been very quiet when the one person talked about it. <laughs> way, said, don't say any question is not worth asking because everybody else might have the same question. If you have a question, you must try to ask. Uh, what kind of problem can we do? Let's see. Um, Maybe let's take a reactor. So I have a certain, have you all done a reactor course? Okay. So you want to press CSDRS. Okay. So you have certain flow rate, certain inlet composition, and we have A going to products. Okay. And um, out comes F with a different concentration C A. Well, what is happening here is you are feeding a certain actant with a certain concentration C A I. The concentration will be moles per meter cube, if you like. And this will be uh, moles per meter cube. And this will be 3 meter cube per second flow rate. Okay. And it is coming out at the same rate. And it's coming at a different concentration. Why? Because some reaction has taken place. So I need to give you the reaction rate expression. I'm going to say that it is given by minus k times c a. It's a linear uh, first order reaction. Okay. So we want to build a differential equation and then apply the transfer function. Now what is what is the transfer function? The transfer function relates the output to the input. Okay. The relationship between the output and the input. It's going to have some form of like this C A F equals G S times Okay. So, uh, so it is the GS that we want, and the GS captures the dynamics of the process. And of course, you can always put the, the, one of the nice things about the, uh, the transfer function approach is you have isolated the dynamics, which is contained in this, from the input, which is contained in that. So you can make yeah. What is it? S is in the Laplace domain. The transfer function in the Laplace domain. And I will show you how to get that. So I'm just explaining what a transfer function does. A transfer, the objective of a transfer function is to relate the input to the output in a nice separated way. So the separation is the dynamics is captured in GS. We need to see what is the form of GS. We need to develop the GS. And the input. The input we saw can be a step input, a pulse input, a sinusoidal input. So we can study the effect of different variations of the input uh, on the output through this dynamic. Okay. So if uh, uh, well, I start developing the conservation law. So the conservation law is rate of diminution equals rate in minus rate of. There's going to be DDP, the rate of change of concentration of A, the amount of A. Okay. So uh, if V is the volume, I need to identify what is the volume of the tank. Remember, my control volume is this tank, complete tank. Okay. So volume times the concentration gives you the mass of A in the reactor. Dt gives you the rate of change of that mass, that is the rate of accumulation. Because rate in, which is F times C A I, minus rate out, which is F times C A. In an exam, I'll give you this differential equation. So you're not really you don't have to derive that, but you should be able to manipulate from this point on, you should be able to get this equation and identify whether it's linear or nonlinear, whether what is the input, what is the output, and things like that. Okay. 
So any questions on that? So that is the dynamical system. It is, in this case, a first order ordinary differential equation. And f is a constant. And uh, C i can be a function of time. Because that's an input. Okay, I can change it with respect to time. And C a is the output that I'm trying to calculate. Okay. So I'm going to divide through it by f and take b out because b is a constant. Now I could put a variation on this. I could say I'm changing the flow rate also. Then the level will change. Then the volume will change. Then you'll have to write another equation for the total balance. This is now a component balance only for species A. Okay. So this is how we will build later on. I could also add a reactor followed by another reactor. So you should be able to build a transfer function for each unit and put them together. Maybe we'll talk about it later on. Okay. So please do stop me if there are any questions as you're going along. What we're going to do now is write this as V over F, DCA DT. What I've done is I've divided both sides by F, and I'm going to write this as CAI minus CA on the right hand side. Okay. This is what I'm going to call my time constant. V over F is my time constant. Okay. So DCA DT plus CA equals CAI. That is another form. This manipulations you should be able to do it like that. Give it a differential equation, get them into this form, then take the Laplace transform, and that will give you the uh, transfer function. Okay. So in this particular model now, CAI is the forcing term that appears on the right hand side of the differential equation. It's the input. You're going to force the system. And then the output is the concentration variation with respect to time. Okay. So any questions to us? You can choose to stay in the time domain, but then you'll need to be able to solve the differential equation okay, and get the solution in the time domain. Now, you can do that, uh, but there's really no advantage doing going to Laplace domain when you have only a single equation like this. But, uh, at the end, I'll talk about what are the advantages. If I have two reactors in series, then you will see that in the time domain, it becomes a more complicated problem, whereas the Laplace domain, it's only algebraic manipulation. Okay, we will see that soon. Okay, so you are absolutely right. There is no need to go into the plus domain if you are dealing with a single order differential equation. You can solve it much more quickly than in the plus domain. But as the complexity of the system, the network system gets bigger in the Laplace domain, it's all just algebraic manipulations. Okay. So what do I do now? I take the Laplace transform of this. So when I take the Laplace transform, you need to know that the derivative is done by tau times s times C A of s. Plus the Laplace transform of the function itself, the second term. So this is the Laplace transform of the first term. And because I had a derivative, that becomes the derivative becomes s times C A of s. And tau is a function. And the second term simply the same as it is. So it's less than the Laplace domain. Because the Laplace transform of the function is simply C A S equals the right hand side could be a function of time. Okay, so we're just going to represent this as when you take the transform, in the transform domain is going to be the Laplace transform of the input function. Now, if that input function tends we are differing for the moment, what is the nature of the input function? If the input function is a tap function, then I know what is the Laplace transform one over S. If it is an input function, I know what it is one. So right now I'm differing the specifying the input. Now that's all you need to do. Co collect all the S terms and tau S plus one equals C A I of S. Okay. So C A of S, the output, is equal to one divided by tau S plus one times C A I of S. This is the the plus domain representation, and this is your transfer function. Okay, so this transfer function relates the input to the process to the output. Any questions? Think about how you would extend that uh, to this problem. F C A I. What comes in goes to the next reactor. There are two reactors in series. 
I'm sure you've seen this also in your reactor course. What the advantage is that uh, reactor is in series. Uh, so I'm going to call this as CA1, V1, and CA2, V2, and I'm not changing the flow rate. The flow rate is the same. Okay. So what comes out is CA2. What comes out of here is CA1. So if you have to develop a dynamic model for this, what it looks like? Kind of take a peek at this. You're going to have one equation for the first one that looks like this with CA1, and you're going to have write another equation. Okay, let's do that, and we will see uh, the advantage of uh, going into the Laplace domain. So for the first one, it's going to be tau1. Tau1 will be of V1 over F. If the volumes of the reactors are different, then you can have different time constants. Okay, so DCA1. Plus C A one equals C A I. That's the first reactor. Now for the second reactor, I'm going to have tau two times D C A two D T plus C A two equals one. C A one. Okay. So the input to the second reactor uh, is the output from the first reactor. Okay. So if I have to solve this in differential domain, what I need to do is I need to find from this by solving CA1 as a function of time. That's going to be a complicated function, an exponential one. Okay? I need to feed that in here. So my particular solution that I need to dial up is going to be a bit more complicated. And you can imagine if it is uh, more complicated with three cycles, this gets very complicated. How does it look in the Laplace domain? In the Laplace domain, this is going to give you CA1 is equal to 1 over tau 1s plus 1 times CAI, and CA2 is going to be equal to 1 over tau 2s plus 1 CA1. Okay. Now, these are algebraic expressions, so it's very easy to eliminate CA1 if you want to so choose. So this is going to be equal to 1 over tau 2s plus 1, tau 2s plus 1, 1 over tau 1s plus 1 multiplied by CAI. So for the combined system, okay, for this combined system, if I ask you to find the transfer function, that transfer function is nothing but the product of the two individual transfer functions. That relates the output from the second reactor to the input to the first reactor. Okay? And th this algebraic manipulation, even when we have recycle and stuff like that, will become a lot easier. That's the reason why, uh, one of the reasons why we go into the Laplace thing. Any questions? Oh, oh my God! I, I, I forgot that completely. <laughs> my model that I started out with is completely wrong. <laughs> See, I didn't prepare for this lecture. <laughs> I just made a big problem, but I'm glad you raised it because you'll have the wrong notes. <laughs> What about the chemical reaction? Where does the chemical reaction occur? It occurs, the left hand side is rate of accumulation, it's rate is minus rate of minus the rate of disappearance by the reactor. Okay? So I should actually have, and do this all in grid now, minus K times C A. Okay? So what does that do to the problem? It has, well now you will have minus the a times C A divided by F. The next step you're dividing everything by F. Okay? So I, I need to erase this. Okay. So so I have two terms on the right hand side. So let me just write this as C A I minus 1 plus beta times CA, where I'm going to let beta is equal to K divided by F, some sort of a reaction constant. Okay? So I have two terms on the right hand side, but they are both multiplied by CA. So then it becomes uh, on the left hand side, when you bring it to the left hand side, it's going to become 1 plus beta times CA equals CA. Okay, 
So now if I take the Laplace transform, the first term will be the same. The second term I need to change. I'm sorry. I, I hope I've not confused you by dropping the term. I didn't even think about it. Okay, so I'm recording it. All the errors and everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so plus one plus beta times C A of S. Okay. In fact, that is what I wanted to illustrate how the <coughs> reaction term will affect it when I forgot about it. So when you do this, you're going to get tau S instead of plus one, you will have Plus one plus beta, right? One plus beta, which is just a number. Okay, so here you'll have one plus beta. Now beta is a number. Okay, the reaction constant, uh, rate constant, should be given to you, and the flow rate you know, so you can calculate what beta is. Okay, so that will be the transfer function for a reactor. Okay, thank you very much for raising question. <laughs> Yeah. It's a first order differential equation. And uh, so the typical form of the first order transfer function will always be uh, something like this g equals 1 over part a over. Now, remember, we talked about the equivalence between a first order and second order stuff. Now, when you have two reactions, like, two reactors like this, this is now two first order system, which is equivalent to a second order system. Okay. So you can actually eliminate the variable and convert that into a second order system. Or, if you see it here, this will be a second order transfer function, the product of two first order transfer functions will be a second order transfer function. We will see later on how does the dynamic response of a second order transfer function look. We have already seen the response of a first order transfer function. Typically it's an exponential uh, without any overshoot or anything. Second order will introduce an overshoot and an oscillation, things like that. Okay? Yeah. So when you have the Oh, in an exam? That I will have to specify what uh, what I want you to do with it. I may just say develop the transfer function, then you are done with it. Or I might say uh, develop a dynamic response to a sinusoidal input or a step input. This is why I would like you to get to MATLAB so that in a second midterm. Then I can ask you to do all those things in Simulink or MATLAB. And obviously, in an exam, I'm not going to ask you to plot my hand. <laughs> <laughs> So you can guess what kind of questions I can ask. I can certainly ask you to invert it if it is uh, involving partial fractions, no more than a quadratic. I expect you to be able to solve a quadratic uh, with a calculator or by hand. Okay? And so do partial fractions, and then using the tables, go back to the time domain. So I might ask you to get the time response to a set response for a, at, at most a second order process, two first order processes. No, no, it could be part of this exam. Uh, it could be part of this exam, meaning when I say, okay, you obtain your, you obtain your first order transfer function here, and then say, okay, now I'm going to, a numerical example would be, I give you the concentration goes from, uh, I make a step change in the inlet concentration from 25% to 35%. Okay, and then I say, okay, um, how long does it take for the outlet concentration to change by a certain percentage? Now, what do you do? And the kinds of function, and kinds of function doesn't answer the question, that question, right? So that's something that you should be able to do. What could you do if I pose that question? I say, develop the kinds of function, you've done it. In the second part, I say that the inlet concentration is changed by 25%. Find the time it takes for the outlet concentration to change by 15% or 10%. Answer the question. 
Of the alpha, right. Do an inverse, and we have done this in the node. It is in the node, so the from such a system. So you will have a typical response if you remember, uh, something like y divided by a equals on the x-axis one minus e to the power minus t over tau. A is the amplitude of the stack, and the typical response looks something like that. So in this particular problem, I'm saying I'm giving you the y-axis a certain change, and I'm asking you to find the time it takes. That means the time is on the x-axis. How you know, right? So you should be able to plug in the numbers and get an answer on that. Is that clear? Any other questions? Oh, the big X and small X? Yeah. yeah. Small X. Okay, okay. Um, that's the, uh, the into the so called deviation variable to uh, define everything from a steady state. Maybe you can take this example itself and look at it. Uh, I did not, in this particular transfer function formulation, I did not post it in terms of a deviation variable. I just worked with the concentration in dimensional form. Okay, But what you can do is if you're given tau times dCA dt um, plus uh, beta. Okay. So this is the dynamical model. You can introduce a deviation variable, and let's call. I guess I've been using capital, but here let me just use the bar. Uh, introduce deviation variable. And I'll tell you why why it is normally done. Okay, so we call it the C bar. C A bar is C A minus C A steady state. So you are measuring all the concentrations from steady state value. Okay. And the reason for that is most plants operate under steady state, so you have a reference value. And most of the plants you want to control to get it back to the steady state. So if there's a disturbance, the variable is going to deviate from that, and you want to get rid of it. You bring it back to the steady state. So you want the variables, the deviation variables to be zero, if you like. Okay. So that's why you introduce this new reference variable as the steady state, you subtract the total concentration from the steady state concentration giving you the deviation variable. Now, how, how does that, if you have to, if you're asked to formulate in terms of deviation variable, how does it change? All you have to do is start with the dynamical equation and then say, what is the steady state? Okay, at steady state, this is going to be zero, and you'll have one plus beta times CAS equals CAIS. That's the steady state. Now, one could ask the question, what is the steady state outlet concentration given the steady state inlet concentration? Okay. That's, you need that information. So by simply solving this equation, given C A I S and beta, you can solve what the outlet concentration is going to be. Okay. But then, to develop in terms of the deviation variable, all you're going to do is subtract one from the other. Okay. So, Okay, I don't know how to have another page. Let me just erase this. I'm not very alert today. <laughs> okay, so uh, when you subtract this from this, you're going to get tau times dCA minus CAS divided by dt. dt. Okay, and that I can do because CAS there is a constant. This term is exactly the same as this, and the benefit of acting as a constant. So the benefit of the constant is the same as this. Now, so let's 
Now I'm going to replace wherever I have this difference, CA minus CA and CA minus CA in terms of the deviation variable that can produce. So that's going to be simply tau times BCA bar D tau plus 1 plus beta times CA bar equals CAI bar. That's in terms of the deviation variable. So the reason for doing it is we want to measure the departures from a normal operating steady state condition. And we will see how this is done for nonlinear systems uh, later on. But for linear systems, it's just a simple trick. Get the dynamic of equation, write it down for the steady state, it's simply copy the factor, and subtract one from the other, and introduce resistance between the current value and the current value as the So the sum of the equation looks exactly the same. Okay, uh, in terms of deviation variable or in terms of uh, normal variable. Okay, any other questions? Can you feel now you are ready, my friend? All right. So let's go. Let's open up the notes. Okay. Okay, uh, it was almost a week, I guess, since we had the lecture. What we were doing in the last lecture was looking at sinusoidal response uh, of a first order system. Okay, so in, in this one, we introduced this idea of an amplitude uh, ratio that is the output from a first order system. When you put uh, a sinusoidal forcing on the input, the output is has the same frequency but a different amplitude. Typically the amplitude is dampened and this amplitude ratio is given by this expression. Okay. And there is also a phase shift. A phase shift simply means the maximum for example does not occur at the same time as the input. The output the maximum is slightly deviated. For example if you take the maximum here and the maximum there there is a shift. That is what we call the phase lag. And these are given by the dynamical parameter, the time constant and the forcing frequency. If you know these two, you can calculate what the outlet uh, amplitude ratio is and the phase lag is. And we basically did two more examples. I would strongly encourage you to review those also. If you're not comfortable with this idea of developing the transfer function, um, we did the heated tank problem and the draining tank problem. And uh, we saw an example of an impulse response from a draining tank problem. And those are all good examples. Like here, we saw a uh, heated tank problem. This is in a first order ordinary differential equation. In the Laplace domain, it gives you a first order tank problem. The formula is exactly the same as the one that we saw for the mercury thermometer problem, which is what we have been studying all along. And then we did this example of a draining tank problem where the height changes. And if you assume that uh, the drainage rate is proportional to h over r, which is not a good assumption because in fluid mechanics we know it is not. We will see how to relax that later on. But if you assume it to be h over r just to have a linear system, then it also results in a first order ordinary differential equation. It also results in a transfer function between an input. In this case, the input is the flow rate and the output is the height, the height that we are monitoring. Okay. So you should not confuse output meaning the output from the process. It should be depending on the problem. In this case, the height of the tank that we are monitoring as the output. And in this problem, we did a specific example. I will encourage you again to look at that example carefully. What we did here was to do the impulse response and then two step responses were proposed and a numerical uh, solution to that, plotting the graph. So once you do that, I might ask you questions like if I have an impulse response, what would be the height at a certain time, 1.2 minutes? So you would have to read this or plug in the time and read the height. Or given the height, what time does the height is reached? Okay. 
So that's basically the cutoff point for your exam on Monday. Now we started the next topic, which is linearization of a nonlinear problem. This is important because most of the chemical processes are nonlinear reactions, uh, distillation columns, thermodynamics, for example. Uh, the nonlinearity fluid mechanics enters in one way or another. In fluid mechanics, if you have a pressure drop which the flow rate relationship, the uh, body charge that you must have seen, Q is proportional, uh, delta P is proportional to V squared. There is a nonlinearity there. In the draining tank problem, drainage rate is proportional to square root of H. Okay. In thermodynamics, the equations of state, cubic equations of state, and rather than equations of state, they're liquid, et cetera. They relate the pressure volume temperature, but in a nonlinear way, in a cubic equation. So in all these cases where the variable that we are interested in solving appears in a nonlinear fashion. So we need to learn how to deal with that when we're developing the uh, transfer function models. So we started by illustrating this idea of linearization in the algebraic domain by saying, let's take a function which is a cubic function. And uh, this function has three roots. It's a cubic function. And we want to linearize that function around one of those solutions, around one of those solutions. Okay? And the way to do that conceptually would be if I, have, if I plot the function f versus x, uh, if the function looks something like this, and these are the roots. I want to approximate that function by a different function, which is a linear function, meaning which is a tangent. Geometrically, that's what we are doing. Okay? We are drawing the tangent to that curve and f finding the equation for the tangent. Then we are saying, I'm going to throw away the original model. This tangent is going to be my function. Now, obviously, the ta function tangent will not be a good approximation to the original function to move far away from the steady state. Okay. Very close to the steady state, I'm OK. So if I want to calculate what is the function value using the tangent, instead of using the function, I'm OK to do that in the neighborhood of the steady state. But if I go far away, it's going to be a poor model. And uh, we did that by taking the derivative of the function, which is the slope, okay, and evaluating the derivative at x equal to 3, which says I am constructing the approximation near that root, near that solution. So the slope that turns out to be 3. If I know the slope, if I know the point through which that equation goes, I can construct the equation. Okay? So that straight line equation is 3 times x minus 3. Okay? And uh, I think I asked you to go through these MATLAB equations. I would strongly encourage you to do this. If you have questions, typically ask me at the next lecture. Okay? Um, I don't want to take the time to illustrate this because I want to complete this idea of uh, linearization. So what I'm doing is now I'm going to plot uh, both the functions. So in this plot function, I'm plotting the original function, which is here, and the linearized function, which is here, the straight line. So I've constructed the linearized function as an algebraic expression using the slope of 3 passing through the data point at x equal to 3. Okay? So this is the linear approximation. And this is the original function. Okay. So what you see in this graph is the red line is the original function. It's a cubic equation, so it should have three roots. And you do see those three roots. There is one root there. There is one root at around 2. And there is another root at around 3. That is, those are the points where the curve of the x axis. These are the solutions of f of x equal to 0. So you should, should be able to extend these things to differential equations. Okay? So the first thing that you need to do is, given a nonlinear problem, find out where the steady states are by solving a nonlinear algebraic equation. Then take the derivative of the differential equation, linearize it around that steady state. And I will illustrate that with the differential equation later on, but I want to introduce a concept here. Okay. So now I'm focusing on this solution. So I want to draw a tangent to this curve, red curve, at that point. And that is a given by the second equation, which is a straight line. So you can see, uh, if I ask you the question at this stage, we're looking at the graph. Uh, over what range in S could I use the blue curve instead of the red curve to predict the function value? My objective is to predict the function value. So I had a original complicated function. I want to 
Very, very narrow range, 2.05 to 3.25 probably, just about right. And so, uh, somewhere in this range, it's not bad. As you go farther away, your prediction is going to be way off from what the actual real value is. Okay? So the idea is the linearization works only around the neighborhood of the linearization itself. Here the linearization is around there. Now, if I ask you to construct a linear approximation around um, x equal to 2, what would you do? I'm asking you to construct a linear approximation on this point, x equal to 2. Right? You have the expression for the derivative already. Okay, That expression is 3x squared minus 10x plus 6. All you have to do is substitute x equal to 2 in there. So that gives you the derivative, the slope. Okay, And then you can uh, multiply the slope by x minus 2, and that will basically give you a tangent. Now, that again would be a good approximation over a neighborhood here. Okay, So if the point that we need to capture from this is if the steady state operation for some reason changes, then the linearized model will not be good. We need to reevaluate the linearization process. We need to find out what the new slopes are. Okay, And that will hopefully become clear when we do a differential equation problem. Any questions on this? Any sense or not? Okay. All right. So now we're going to go and extend this idea of linearization to a differential equation to obtain transfer functions for the linearized model. Okay. This is one of the most important topics in this course. How to do linearization of nonlinear problems, develop transfer functions around linear steady state. Now the problem that we are doing is the draining tank problem. Okay. So you have a flow coming in and a flow going out. And this flow, now we are saying is proportional to square root of x, which is what Bernoulli equation tells us. So it is a nonlinear dependence. The outlet flow rate depends nonlinearly on the height of the water in the tank, that is h. Okay, and this is q, which I can change any way I want. For example, if I increase the flow rate quickly for a short amount of time, then I want to see how does the height change with time. Okay. And previously, we said this was going to be equal to uh, h divided by r. That is, it is proportional to the height, but that is not true. That is not a uh, very good model. So this is actually a much better model. We may say that it is equal to a constant c times square root of h. When we do that, the model becomes like this. a times dh dt equals q of t input minus q output. Okay. This is the rate of accumulation on that of 10 side equals Q input minus Q output. Q input is something that we specify, and Q output is given by 3 times square root of H. So this is a nonlinear model. So can I take the Laplace transform of that? It's not that easy anymore. Nonlinear problems are always difficult to deal with. So what we're going to do is the next idea that you need to recall from calculus is the Taylor series expansion of any nonlinear function. So what does the Taylor series expansion do? It tells you that you can construct an approximation to any function provided you can know all its higher derivatives. Do you understand? Do you remember Taylor series? Way back? Okay. So this is the Taylor series expansion for this output function Q0, which is nothing but Q0 evaluated at the steady state plus Q prime evaluated at the steady state multiplied by H minus HS. That is a deviation from the steady state, h minus h s, plus the second derivative times h minus h s square over 2, etc. Now, linearization simply means I'm going to drop this term. I'm going to drop all the higher order terms. These are again nonlinear terms, for one term. Okay? So that's what restricts us to using near the neighborhood. If you go back and uh, ask the question, instead of a linear model, if I take a Taylor series expansion of this function around this, I can probably fit a parabola. Okay. There will be a quadratic model, a nonlinear model, but it will do better than the linear model for a much larger range. Okay. And the same thing is true here too. If I take a quadratic term, it will do 
much better in, in terms of dynamical representation uh, of the reality, but it's going to be nonlinear. I don't want to be able to solve that. So I'm going to negate all the higher order terms. And that's a very key step. Okay? That's what is called linearization. So we're taking from the Taylor series expansion the base state, which is the steady state, plus the deviation from the steady state to the first term in the Taylor series expansion. Now, this Q prime is the slope of the function evaluated at the steady state, the same idea that we saw in the graph. Okay? So you need to be able to take the derivative of the given function, in this case it is C times derivative of H, and plug in HS. So you need to know where the steady state is. So the steady state coefficient will change with, uh, with the steady state. So what is Q prime H of S? It is simply the derivative of this. So take the derivative of C times square root of H, which is 1 over 2 times uh, 1 over uh, square root of H. But I'm evaluating this at the steady state. Okay? So this is a number. It's a number that is evaluated at the steady state and plugged in there. Am I going fast? Any question? Okay. So what happens is that outlet flow rate now becomes Q. This is the Taylor series expansion. Q at HS plus this coefficient, the derivative of the function evaluated at HS, multiplied by this linear term, H minus HS. Okay. So this is what we would call some sort of a resistance coefficient. Related to what we've seen before. Okay, then you can put this problem in the same terminology as before. Okay, one over R1 times H minus HS. Now this is uh, QT is the input, and Q0S is the steady state output. Okay, and now we can introduce the deviation variable using the same techniques that we did before. H minus HS on the left hand side. This occurs naturally in the Taylor series expansion. Deviation from the steady state. So this is the deviation variable. And this again occurs naturally from the Taylor series expansion as the first term. And this difference is your deviation variable. Uh, okay, so you introduce those deviation variables, you get exactly the same form as we had for the linear model, except this coefficient r is calculated in a complicated way by taking the derivative of the function and evaluating it at the steady state. So in this particular case, that uh, R1 is given by this expression, which depends on the steady state. That's why if this model is evaluated at one steady state, and you move the steady state away, this model will not be good unless you go back and reevaluate your resistance coefficient. And we're going to illustrate that with a specific example later on. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. It's a function. It's the output function. Yeah. Right. It is a function of age. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, good, good question. Uh, in the algebraic case, it is the root of that algebraic equation. But in this case, it's the root of the steady state solution. So HS is a steady state value. So what I need to do is go back to this differential equation, uh, sorry, this differential equation, and set DHDT equal to zero, and then solve these, solve for H, and that will be your HS. So if I have Q, the inlet rate at a constant rate, then HS would be simply equal to Q divided by C uh, so squared. That will be your steady state. That's a number you need to be able to calculate because you need to evaluate this resistance coefficient at the steady state. So you should be able to solve for the steady state. In this case, there is a nonlinear equation, but it's quadratic, so it's fairly easy to solve for it. But in other cases, that may itself be a, a challenge, but MATLAB has a solver called solve, which will solve any nonlinear algebraic equation. Any other questions? Okay, so good luck in your exam. And remember, the key to success in my exam is you will be stressed on time. Okay, so you might find yourself stressed on time.
you don't distribute your time, you're not going to be able to address all of the questions. Because okay? I believe that if I give you unlimited time, all of you can solve all the problems. <laughs> so to start out the A's and the B's and the C's, I make it constrained on the time.